Well, good evening, everybody. I've already welcomed the people in the uh, sanctuary, welcome you online. My name is Sean, and we are glad that you are here tonight. Hope you're going okay. It's been a rough couple of about four or five days here in the Mid-South with some flooding, and I'll talk about that at the end of the service, but I uh, hope where you are, you're doing okay. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, kind of like a piggyback of what we discussed on Sunday morning, and that is the real blessing of, um, of serving people. That's what we talked about on Sunday morning. And I kind of want to just piggyback a little bit off of that and talk tonight about why, why is serving others important? Now, some of us are like, well, I know it's just important because that's just what we do, isn't it? I, mean, you know, I understand that, but why? Why do we go about serving other people? Not only about the blessing that we receive from it, and you can scroll down and look at that on, on Sunday morning, but let me just talk a little bit tonight, and I want us to be able to turn to the first book of the New Testament. And this, uh, this book is called the, the Gospel According to Matthew, and uh, we're going to take a look at the 20th chapter, and we're going to take a look at one of these very important texts for us to have. By the way, as I mentioned, um, we will get, um, you know what, I didn't do that for you, Stacy and Shane. I will make sure uh, next week to send the file to our technical team, and they can put it up on our um, feed next Wednesday night. But for those that are with us tonight, if you want to find a, a foundational scripture reading chart, if you will, that I've put together, feel free to do this. Uh, they're on the communion table over there, and we can do that. So my point being, let's take a look at Matthew chapter 20, and we're going to take a look, and I just put this little easel together here tonight, so maybe this is, uh, you know, some like to see things visibly, and uh, we're going to talk about that in just a second. So let's take a look if we can, and we're just going to read Matthew chapter 20 just for a second, and then we'll have the opportunity to discuss this. Uh, we talked about this on Sunday morning, but I want to give more context tonight, and I want to have more group discussion, and if you're there tonight, um, why don't you go ahead and um, let us know you're with us, and then what we'll do is we'll have a discussion. You can discuss things at home as well. So here we go. We're just going to read the same passage as we did on Sunday morning, and Jesus says this to his disciples, his followers. He says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And then he says in verse 26, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. And these are words that you need to highlight, circle. I don't know how you do your studying. But he says, in Matthew, when he looked at Jesus and he heard from Jesus, he ob you know, obviously knew I'm sure Jesus told him explicitly, and then he looked at his life, and he was able to say, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Now, we can see this as late in the book of Matthew, and he was, Matthew was able to look at the life of Jesus and see someone who just served people. I mean, let's just take a moment. If you're at home, chime in and let us know, but what are some of the, what are some of the ways that and just off of the top of your head, Jesus served people. He fed them, right? He fed multitudes. Healed people. Anybody else? Comforted people. Yeah. Miraculous, raised people from the dead. He, he cared for people. Uh, he, he went to What? people that were on the outside of life. He, he kind of took a look at people that were poor, that were destitute, prostitutes. Woman at the exact hour, I was just getting there. Totally different, you know, Jewish people didn't affiliate with Samar uh, Samaritans. They worshiped in different places, and they had a different history, and we don't mess with those people. So the point being is that Jesus was somebody that when Matthew looked, he said, this is who Jesus is. 
He serves people, and he's told us he's going to give his life as a ransom for us. So I had, uh, I had lunch uh, on Sunday with a new couple that's coming to our church. My wife and I did. And he said, he said, appreciate your message this morning. He said, I was thinking about it this way. And I said, you're right on. Uh, the world kind of takes a look at the first try. You know, it's, it's the people, more people down here, and me up there. And everything kind of comes to me, right? I want people to serve me. I want people to take care of me. I want to, if need be, um, you know, use people so that I can get on top. But Jesus flips the equation, doesn't he? He flips the pyramid upside down. And I said to this gentleman, I said, that's a nice way of seeing it. Because the reality is we're here, right? And we are called in a larger way throughout our life to care and serve more people as we live our life. So it's a, it's a good way of understanding. And you can look back on Sunday's message, but that's what the Beatitudes are all about. There's not a one of them that tells us that we're called to be poor in spirit. Because some translations through the years have done that. Blessed are those who think they're poor. That's, that's a terrible translation. When you're poor in spirit, you don't have to think about it. You know it. The people in Jesus' time knew who they were. They knew that they were poor in spirit. They had nothing to offer to anyone. Matter of fact, most of the religious culture wouldn't even accept them into their life. They knew they were poor. And yet, what does Jesus say? He says, you know, you're, you're going to be rich in the kingdom of God. You are welcomed to the kingdom of God. And you're going to, each one of those things, he's simply, again, when I talked about this on Sunday, every one of those verbs and those beatitudes are in an indicative mood, meaning that they're just indicating something. They're just proclaiming something. They're not telling us or commanding us to do anything. They're, Jesus is opening up his Sermon on the Mount, and he basically throws wide open the door, and he proclaims, the good news, everyone and anyone is welcomed into the kingdom of God, and through me, you are blessed in the kingdom of God. That's you and me. That's you at home or wherever you may be tonight. You are blessed as you trust Jesus because through him, you're able to enter the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has always been around. Its availability was a different story. <laughs> and Jesus came and said, you are able, whoever you are, Wherever you've been, whatever has happened in your life, when you walk into the kingdom through me, you are new. Today is a new day of grace. Amen to that? And that's good news for us, isn't it? I don't care if you've followed Jesus a day or 20 years. It's always good to know the mercies and grace of God are new every day. And whoever and wherever we are, we can get up and through Jesus experience blessedness in the kingdom of God. So I just wanted to give that to you, and I just thought, man, you know what? Here's a gentleman who's been coming to our church for two or three weeks, and, you know, God instills in him an observation. It's like it's very, very, very applicable to what Jesus says. He inverts everything. And the people who thought they were in really had to question whether they were in or out. Jesus was saying, you think you're close to the heart of God, let me tell you. Uh, the way you're going, you're not close to the heart of God. And converse, or inversely, what? The people who thought they were far away were closer to the kingdom of God because they had a humbleness about and desiring to walk into the kingdom of God through Jesus. Okay, there we are. Now, what I want to be able to talk about tonight is this whole idea of how serving others helps us. And I, I'm going to get to this passage again, but I want to just talk about three things. And first of all, serving others trains us away from certain character issues that we have to all deal with. And then secondly, it clarifies our purpose in life. Serving helps to clarify our purpose. I'm going to get there. And then third, it deepens our understanding and experience of Jesus. So, Trains, clarifies, and deepens. And the first one that I want to get to, and this is where I want everybody, whether you're at home, comment in if you want to. Let us know that you're with us and then comment on this. But definitely people here in the sanctuary. Serving trains us 
and it trains us away from destructive things we can do in our life and destructive traits that we can just continue on. Even many Christians are this way. And I just want to make sure that I say this without judgment, but it's, I think it's a pretty uh, valid observation of even the church in our Western culture. And the first one that it trains us away from is arrogance. It trains us away from having a certain level of condescending. You know what it means to be condescending towards someone? That you feel like you have a superiority or an arrogance in consideration of other people. And serving helps us to see them. It helps us to understand that in many ways, people that we think are in need are much more rich than what we are. It trains us against being arrogant in our own life. And I think many of us just watch, have to watch out for our own way that we live our life and the way that we assume things, the way that we see our own life. And sometimes we need to have a better idea about the fact that we don't know it all. And the reality is people that we think, who has done this before? You've seen somebody that's gone through a difficult time and you think you can figure it out. You think you know the reason why they're going through difficult times. It's a little different from what Job's friends were doing, but it comes out of the same pot. That whole idea of, well, there must be something wrong in your, in your Christian life, Job. It must be something wrong in your life because if God's doing this to you, there must be some kind of sin in your life. And if you don't watch out, Job's friends mentality creeps into us as well. People that have a hard time, people that are going through difficult times, well, they could do better if they really put their mind to it. Who's ever had that kind of, that's arrogant. For us to assume that we know the reality of what somebody else is going through. And when you serve other people, guess what you do? You begin to understand their story. You see life from their perspective. And Jesus is always wanting us to do what? To be humble. To see life from the perspective of someone that we are serving. Secondly, it deals with this whole sense of selfish ambition. When you serve other people, it, it trains us away from being someone who's always thinking about, how am I going to get ahead? Now, there's nothing wrong with having, having ambition. Uh, to say that I have ambition means I want my life to count. I want to have a sense of which I want to be a person who lives a full life and achieves something worthwhile. There's nothing wrong with ambition. Selfish ambition is the problem. When your kingdom becomes bigger than God's kingdom for you. You understand my point there? Nothing wrong with being a person who wants their life to count. But whose agenda are you wanting to count in your life? That's where the whole issue comes from. And the context for this passage that we've just talked about. Jesus didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many the whole idea that Jesus says, not so with you, you're to be servants. What's the context? You know the context here. The mother of James and John comes to Jesus. And let's go back, if we can, to verse 21. Is that a possibility for you? Just look back there, verse 20 and 21. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, they're James and John, that's their proper name, came to Jesus with her sons and Kneeling down, ask a favor of him. Was it you want, Jesus? He knew. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left hand in your kingdom. The places of power, of control. You don't even know what you talk about here, Jesus. Now, Jesus goes on. He says, you know, that you don't understand what you're talking about. To be a servant is going to cost. You don't even know. But look what happens here in verse 24. When the other apostles heard this, they were indignant with the two brothers. See, that's the whole context, selfish ambition. This doesn't have to be you. You can come from a family that works this way, just like this mother. Jesus, can I put in a good word for my sons? Because her whole idea was she wanted her sons to sit in the place of power and privilege and the ability to, you know, to have control and that sense of which, oh, they're my sons. Now, there's nothing wrong as a parent for your a desire for your kids to, again, to live a life that counts. Nothing wrong with that. 
But when you do so at the result of thinking that I want my sons to have privileges that other people don't, you are really putting yourself in bad spots because God understands the real places of power and authority aren't next to him. It's with the people that need to be served. And selfish ambition is a very difficult thing in life. And we all have to come to realize that when we serve other people, we begin to understand it's not sitting in the place of authority. It's being willing to serve the lowly. That's where the power of Jesus comes into your life. Anybody want to share anything to that? Any lessons about that in your life? What does Paul say about Jesus in Philippians? It's one of the greatest. It's pro- it was probably a hymn or probably a poem or something, and uh, Paul included it in his letter to the Philippians. But he says, you know, Jesus, although he was equal with God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he gave himself away. He gave himself away even uh, to become a servant, and he gave even literally his life away. That's at the very heart of who our creator and redeemer and sustainer is in our life. And some of the most powerful people are some of the most empty people in life as well. You don't find it there. You find it when you realize that in loving and caring and serving other people, you find out what life is all about. And it trains us away. See how we have to train ourselves. We just can't try. We have, to, uh, we have to say to ourselves, I'm going to serve other people because that trains my body and it trains my mind to realize and to go against the pull of this worldly way of living our life. It helps us to pull away from that sense in which everything in our life is about getting ahead. Jesus helps us to understand our life really begins when we're willing to give our life away. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm not trying to take the glory from that, but I think it was in one of my messages that I talked about that. So if it was, great. If, if you're saying that's from seven years ago, Sutton, then that's fine. But the, But the reality is, that's the reality. If serving is beneath you, leadership is a, you know, I'm sorry, if leadership, I'm sorry, if serving is beneath you, lead, yeah, it's beyond you, yes. And I think it's very true. If you can't serve people, you don't haven't, you haven't come to realize and you need to train yourself to get away from this sense of the fact of ambition. Getting to the top is going to make you happy. Jesus is going to always be there with you and he wants us to learn that lesson and uh, training to be serving other people. And sometimes it's not the emotional thing to do. You and I don't want to go out and do things of service to other people. But as we do them, we find out what life is all about. Okay, the last one I'm going to talk about tonight is ingratitude. Training, training uh, to go and serve helps us with ingratitude. Who here has come to the point sometime where you've taken for granted your blessings? I mean, isn't that the common, how can I say it, ill of everybody? We just don't remember to remember the blessings we have. What happens when you go serve other people? You quickly come to understand how blessed you are, don't you? And you don't do it, again, you don't go in a condescending way where, you know what, my life is so much better than yours, and I'm so thankful for it. no. But when you leave and you go to yourself, Lord, thank you for the blessings you've given me. Thank I I pray for this brother or sister. I'm concerned I'm going to continue to care for these people. But thank you nonetheless for the blessings that you've given to me. Anybody want to share anything to that? We can talk about resentment, but a lot of people resent other people just for a variety of reasons. And when you get to know and serve people, you begin to understand there's so much more that unites us and so much more that you can love in a person than to resent in a person, and they with you. Do you ever have this? It happens in high school a lot. But you think you know the person, and then you get to know them, and it changes your opinion about them 
most times for the good. Because we just have ways of resenting people. And when you get to know them, you're able to say, I mean, I used to, yeah, I'll just leave it there. So these are ways to help training ourselves to serve other people. Now, let's go on to the clarifying part part here. And this deals with purpose. This deals with purpose. Serving other people clarifies the fact, and this is very, very important for us, that living for the approval of people is a constant temptation for us. And when we serve other people, it helps us to see that we live our life for God, not the approval of other people. The second temptation of Jesus, um, you want to go to Matthew chapter 4. For, we're, we're in Matthew, right, chapter 20. Go back to Matthew chapter 4 just for a second. And uh, you know that Jesus was tempted many times, but we, we see these three epic temptations that are listed. And Matthew uh, shows this one to be the second one. He says, then the devil took him. This is uh, Matthew chapter 4, and this is verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourselves down. It's always interesting when you see temptation. It questions reality. If, if, he knew he, he knew who he was. If you are the son of God, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their, hand, uh, in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Basically, what Satan is doing for Jesus is making him a freak show, a spiritual sideshow with God's miraculous power that would inevitably inevitably make Jesus very popular. He would be a person who people would enjoy seeing. And Jesus knew that that wasn't what his heavenly father wanted his life. And he says to him, don't put the Lord to the test. You know, this is what my... Let's go back to what Matthew says later. My purpose in life is to come and give my life away, not to become a spiritual freak show of just performing miraculous things with my power just to become popular. And you know what? That is still the issue with us today. Serving helps us to understand our purpose in life is serving God. And serving other people helps push us away from feeling the need to always have the approval of man. Because when you serve, you really begin to understand, I don't need the approval of people. When I serve, I find out what my identity really is. No, no, growing up, it's kind of one of those things somebody has said here, as you grow up, or as you grow older, you begin to see that reality in life. And, And it's kind of funny, but... You know how so often as a younger person you were concerned about how you looked and how people thought you looked? Now, I'm all for presenting yourself halfway presentably, but as I grow older, I don't really care what I look like. Now, in front of you, I mean, I'm, there's limits to that. I mean, as I represent this church, I want to be presentable. But there are a whole bunch of other times in my life which, you know what, eh, Okay, it, you know, I don't really need the approval of people to tell me what my purpose is in life. That's all I'm trying to get to. And so many people live for the approval of other people. And the reality is when you serve, it helps to break that pull of your purpose in life. Is it for people or is it for God's pleasure in your life? Amen to that? And I hope that becomes a reality for all of us tonight that As you come to live your life, are you able to see that serving others gives you a true sense of the Lord's approval in your life? Now, you don't do it for this reason, but have you served in your own life and you've come to realize when you walk away or you go home or you see, you know, the value of serving other people, you're able to go home and go, nothing better than this. Nothing better than this. Nothing better than this. It far beats the approval of people. Why is that the case? Why is trying to find the approval of people such an endless vanity in life? Go ahead, Donna. No, 
No doubt. No doubt. It's been shown when you get a like on Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or somebody sees your Instagram video, it releases, you know, these chemicals that let you know the warmth of knowing you've been accepted and liked. But the only problem is, you know what? Tomorrow, it all may change. Or tomorrow, you may not have what everybody likes. Exactly right. People change every day. Their likes change every day. And my point being is that serving helps us to see the vanity of trying to please people and not saying, Lord, I want to find you in serving. Because just as you came to seek and to save, just as you came to serve and not be served, that's where I find my true identity and my purpose in life. <laughs> yeah, and somebody asked the whole problem, isn't it, Donna? Somebody else has something better. The likes have gone somewhere else. And guess what happens? People chase those likes all the time. They will sell their soul to get more likes. And serving helps us to see the reality of Jesus in our life. I just, I hope that really hits home for us tonight. I really do. Okay, uh, one last thing here. And this is where I want to just want to spend about five minutes and then we'll be done. Uh, it trains us away from these defective and destructive character traits that the world just kind of teaches us as we grow up. That's the first thing. Secondly, it clarifies our purpose because we serve for the glory of Jesus, not ourself. Uh, I, there's a verse that I want us to get to tonight, and I just looked over it. Let's turn, if we can, real quick to Colossians. This is one of Paul's great letters. And that's why I want you to have the foundational scripture passage um, uh, insert that I made up because Colossians chapter 3 is one of the most important chapters of scripture. And it's one that we should all be familiar with. And he is speaking to different relationships in society. He's talking about rules for holy living. That's the title of chapter 3 of Colossians. And now he's been talking about rules for Christian households wives and children and fathers, and now he turns, at that time, slavery was very much a part of life. And Paul is concerned. Um, people ask, well, why didn't Paul just immediately say, slavery is bad, let's have a revolt? He saw that the most important thing is to do is to change the people's hearts first so that they could begin to see the reality and the destructiveness of slavery. So, but he says to slaves, he says to them, look what he says. He says, verse 22, if you want to get there. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything you do, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, this is what the general principle is here. It's good, if it's good for slaves at this time, it's good for us, isn't it? And Paul says, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. And what's he say next? As to the Lord. Yeah. As working for the Lord, not for men. You see how easy it is to do things for the approval of people. And Paul says to these people that are slaves, you know what? There's a higher concern that you can work and know that what you're doing is pleasing to God. You're in a bad situation, but you can find the Lord's favor by Live in your life for the purpose of glorifying and live in your life for him, not for the approval of people. And if he can say that to people that were in slavery at the time, how much more appropriate is that for us to be able to say, you know what, when I work, am I working for a paycheck or am I working for Jesus? When I work, how I work, is it reflecting the values of Jesus? Can people see Jesus in me? Now, I'm not trying to say you have to be a workaholic because some have gone to that far. No, matter of fact, sometimes... You know, some people need to say, go home. Your family needs you. All I'm trying to say is, you don't live for the approval of people. You look for the approval of God. So that's the second one. Third one, it deepens our experience of Jesus. We're, let's go back to Matthew. Uh, we're in chapter 20. Let's go to Matthew 25. It's hot in our sanctuary, and some of you are probably fighting, not going to sleep. And uh, we'll be done here in just a second. But this is very important. I think many of you are aware of this. Uh, this is a parable sung 
don't know. It's like, is this really a parable? Is this more of a teaching? But uh, Jesus says, uh, at the end of life, when he makes all things new and all things right, he's going to separate sheep from goats. Sheep are, uh, sheep are, are like good creatures. Sh- goats, uh, they're not. I'm not trying to get down on goats, but he just uses that metaphor in animal life. And he says, in verse 34, he says, Then the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? When do we see you, a stranger, invite you in and needing clothes and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And then the king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it for me. What does your translation have to say there in verse 40? Whatever you did for the least of these... Do you have brothers and sisters for members of my family? Yep. You did it for me. Isn't it interesting to see, and I just want us to pull back here just for a second. You know me probably now. I've been here several years. And you, 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 you understand a lot of what I say is what? That Jesus just not only didn't provide our forgiveness, but he gave us what? New life. And that life in Jesus really transforms who we are as people. And it's evident, I think, in these texts. Notice how righteous people don't even think anything of this. What what, what do they say? Jesus. Yeah, this was just kind of a natural thing. But what does he say? Whenever you've done it unto the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you've done it unto me. And the reality is this, when you have the life of Jesus in you, that's what the, if I can say it this way, the defining part here is that when you have Jesus' life within you, it's a natural byproduct of you to serve, and it just becomes naturally part of your life. Why would it become naturally part of your life? Why do you think? There's no right answer, but what, what do you think it might be? Exactly. As the one who served you becomes more apparent in your life, It just becomes more natural for you to reciprocate with the other people of your life, right? As Jesus is graceful to you, as he's been merciful to you, as he's been compassionate to you, you have a natural instinct to start doing that. for them. But it all stems from the fact that Jesus' life is the source of your life. And the righteous are like, well, this is no big deal, Jesus. It is a big deal, but because Jesus is living his life through us, we're able to do exactly what he wants us to do. It's not even a big thing, but it is a big thing to Jesus because he says, whenever you do it for the least of my brothers and sisters. Now, this text, just so you'll be aware, and we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty tonight, has been debated for years and years and years and years and years and years and years, 300 so. Well, what does this mean? Does this mean, uh, um, you know, brothers and sisters like, Everybody, or does this mean particularly brothers and sisters in in our faith? So is he talking about just caring for Christians here? Is he caring for all people? I don't think we have to split that. I think, if you want to know my particular feeling, I think the priority, and I'll show you in just a second, I think the priority in our serving should be to other brothers and sisters in Christ. Jesus said, people will know that you're my disciples because of what? Your love for one another. He's talking to Christians at that moment. Now listen, don't go, oh, that means we just got to care for people within our own, you know, brothers and sisters and Jesus, and don't have to care for, no, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm trying to say is I think there is a priority that first to the fellow believer, and when you name the name of Jesus, there are consequences to that. And sometimes Christians, as other people do, 
go through difficulties, and we're concerned to care. What, the, what does the Luke looks at the early church, and he says there was no needy person among them. He said that's the way the early, they took care of their fellow brothers and sisters. Turn, if you want to, real quick, to Galatians chapter 6, and then we're going to be done. Galatians chapter 6. So we work our way, you know, through First and Second Corinthians, and then we come to the book of Galatians, and we're going to be in the last chapter, which is chapter 6. You all with me? Okay. We're going to get at chapter 6, verse 9 here and 10, but let's just go back and pick up a context in verse 7. He says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A person reaps what they sow. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. And this is the principle that is really important. Verse 9, let us, become, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And look what it says here, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. <clears throat> See, that's important. Don't discriminate between people. If somebody's in front of you, they're not there by happenstance. Help them as you're able to do so. Okay? That's a general principle. Now, particularly, he goes on and says a particular case right here. What's he say? To do good of all pe- to, to do good to all people. Look at this last clause. Read it with me. Especially to those who belong to the family of believers. So I think there's a principle within a general principle, and that is we should care, particularly for fellow brothers and sisters. And at this particular time, you know in Afghanistan, there are many underground Christians whose life is in danger. What's the least that we can do for them? Pray for them. Now, in due time, if we can, we're going to try to find ways to help them, practically speaking. But my point is we need to care for other brothers and sisters, but also do good and serve all people. And I just want to leave that with you. A person is in your life for a reason. So take care of them as as you can. But particularly, and I think what Jesus is saying in that passage right there is, whatever you do for these little brothers and sisters, that phrase is used twice uh, before, before that, in Matthew, and it refers to fellow brothers and sisters. And I think that is our primary care, is that we should be caring for other brothers and sisters. And uh, that should become a very high priority on our list. But never should we go to the other extreme, okay, we're just going to do that and not care for other people. That is not what the Bible would ever tell us to do. Whoever's in front of you is your neighbor, and you are to serve and care for them as Jesus has served and cared for you. Amen to that? I hope that rings true to you. So, who was it in your life? Who is it that you need to serve? Maybe you need to look at it this way and say to yourself, Sean, I hate to admit this, but I think sometimes I'm overly confident or even arrogant. I struggle with ingratitude in my life. I'm just saying this. I'm not looking at anybody here, okay? But I'm just saying serving helps with that. And perhaps it's always good for us to come back and say, what, when I do the things I do, when I do the things I do in my life, who am I ultimately trying to please? And that's a very important thing for us to get to. In all that we do, Live our life for the glory of God. Amen to that? And let the chips fall where they may with other people. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm simply trying to say so oftentimes we look at the approval of people that compromises our commitment to what God wants us to do. Okay. And then it helps. What I just want to read uh, Mother Teresa's line to you again as we close up because it's important for us. Mother Teresa said, I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is a hungry Jesus. I must feed him. 
This is sick, Jesus. This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. And then these are the words that are really important. I serve because I love Jesus. And I don't know how to say this other than this. Worship is our primary concern in life. We need to be good worshipers. And we sense God when we worship. It helps bring us into his presence, and we sense his presence. But I'm going to say this, and I don't want it to get too literal, but in a way, we sense God's presence in worship, but we see the Lord as we serve other people. We see the Lord through the eyes of other people as we serve them. Why? Because they've been made in the image of God as well, and particularly for brothers and sisters in Jesus. When we meet with them, we see Jesus in them. And I have talked to many different people who have said, it was through service that my life became much more intimate with Jesus. And I hope that inspires you to say, oh, where am I serving people? Where am I serving people? Uh, I'll tell you a quick story, and then uh, I'll leave it here. I don't even know when it was. It, it was while I was on campus, so uh, it was probably as a soft, probably as a freshman or sophomore. I went to school at American University in Washington D.C. and I had some time after baseball got done in the fall, <clears throat> and I went with some other people downtown, Washington D.C. And uh, you know those ice cream trucks? Uh, it was converted over into um, um, a vehicle that was used by a soup kitchen. And we went to several stops in, uh, in downtown Washington, D.C. And one of the stops was Lafayette Square. Have, have you ever been to D.C. before? It's right across the street from the White House. And literally, we'll go around the corner, because there's one-way streets. We'll go past the White House, make two lefts, and come up on a side street, looking right across the street from the White House. And as soon as the truck would come up, the indigent, the poor, the disabled, the mentally unstable, knew the truck was there to feed them. And literally, it was like, you know, in the fall, it was dark, and these people would come out. And there was a gentleman who was on crutches. And over a period of time, I got to know him, and <clears throat> he was um, in, in rough, rough shape. To the point that one time, he, he smelled so badly and was in such bad shape, we took him back to the... Um, soup kitchen facility, and they had a makeshift, well, I'm not talking about like a, a hose that went over like, a, you know, like tarps for a little shower, and this man stunk so badly, and he could hardly stand, and a couple people held him, and, and as I was able to bathe him, he had every imaginable smell, and he literally had not changed his, uh, his clothes or his underwear for months, and uh, it almost made me gag. But in doing so, I began to understand more about my life, more about the blessings that I had had, and I literally, uh, you know, he, he didn't have anything. To, the place didn't have anything to give him, so I actually... I actually took off my clothes and gave him my socks, my underwear, and my T-shirt. And we got him dressed and took him back to Lafayette Square. And he looked in my face and simply didn't say a word, but he let me know that I was like an angel to him that night. And I went home and I realized then that in some capacity, I didn't even know I was going to become a minister at that time. But all I knew was there was nothing better than that experience in my life. As horrible as it was, and I mean, I was literally on the verge of throwing up when I finally got this gentleman into the shower. But I thought to myself as I went home, Lord, if some way I could do this in my life, that's what I want to do. And all I'm trying to tell you is somehow we find Jesus when we give ourselves away in serving other people. That's all I can tell you. And I can't tell you with us sitting in these nice chairs, well, you know, I wish you would tell me now 
so that when I go, you know, I'll, get, I'll, I'll have the experience. No. You've got to get your feet wet in doing it. But I'm going to tell you this. The Lord will meet you when you serve other people, when you give your life away. That's one experience in my life, and I have to grow a lot in my life in serving other people, even to this day, 40 years later, 35 years later. I'm just trying to tell you, Jesus helps us to see him in those moments. You guys got any experiences you want to share with that, anybody online? Let me just share one thing. It's, it was really a harsh reality to look on one side of Pennsylvania Avenue and see the epitome of Western culture and capitalism and power and, and then look 60 feet across the street and see, unfortunately, those that are left out of our society. It's very, very difficult. Let's pray just for a moment, and I want to make a few announcements, and then we'll close up. Anybody here tonight? Joshua. We have one tonight whose mother just started chemotherapy treatments. We need to be praying for our area west of us. Waverly is um, going through a very difficult time. I'll talk more about that as we go, but several communities have really been hit hard by the recent flooding, we need to be praying for them. Lord, tonight we just want to say to you, open our eyes, help us to serve people. Help us to be last because you'll, you'll be in line right with us. We'll always find you at the back of the line. We will always find you serving because that's where you're serving even to this day. When we've done it unto the least, we've done it unto you, Jesus. Break us of our arrogance. Break us of our condescending way of looking down at other people. Break our addiction to the approval of other people. Jesus, would you help us to seek and to know and to live for your approval and you want us to serve the people of our life. Particularly tonight, Lord, we pray that you'll be with Joshua and her, his mother. Lord, sustain her. Give her encouragement and strength. Bring healing to her and be with the doctors and nurses as they treat Josh's mother. Lord, for all the other needs of our church, we give them to you tonight. And Lord, help us to be a church that serves other people. Not for what they can give to us in return, but simply to serve people because that's exactly what you did. You gave your life away, no strings attached. Help us to be the same type of people and help faith community be that type of church. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in your name. Amen.